I want to talk about something very, very, very complex. But before you leave, I want you to have something very real and very tangible <coughs> that if you choose, you can begin to change the world today. So, well, let's see, how we, let's see if we can get there. But the first thing I think we need to talk about is we need to, to understand this notion of, of a big idea and what that means. And what we're really talking about, what Ted, I believe, shoots for is really the notion of wisdom. And so I, I wanted to really understand what wisdom was. And, and I've, I've sort of created this formula for what wisdom is. And that's going to guide the rest of my comments. Wisdom essentially equals our experience. Wisdom is the sum total of our collective experiences. But it's a little more complex than that. It's not just our experiences. To me, it's our experiences as relates to our mistakes. Now, for the mathematically inclined here, you'll notice that I made it the numerator, which means with more mistakes, our wisdom goes up. Because while we learn a lot from our, our failings, I mean our successes, we tend to learn more from our failings. But as I, as I looked at this formula, this little brief formula, I realized it's more complex than that. It's not just our experiences and the ratio to mistakes. It's that as captured by our capacity for self-reflection. That is why we can have 20-year-old wise people and 60-year-olds that don't have a clue. It's the capacity for self-reflection, but more than just self-reflection, it's the capacity for self-reflection times objectivity and honesty. And notice it's not multiplied. It's not our experiences multiplied by our self-reflection. It's the exponential power of self-reflection. And specifically, self-reflection, that's going to be at the heart of my comments. Now, I want to talk about three things. I would like to talk about sort of the context we face, the problem we face, and the solutions, or a solution to the problem. The context we face globally today is very simply 9 billion people. By 2050, we will have 9 billion people walking the earth and consuming all that we have on the planet. In China, we will have 1.5 billion people. And what most folks don't realize, while we've paid attention, we may have ignored the hidden tiger in India. By 2030, India will surpass China in population. So what does that mean in pragmatic terms? What it means is every year, two New York cities are being built in China, and in India, one in each. All the resources, all the people. So what does that mean in terms of the greater context? What it means, quite simply, is we're trying to take 20 pounds of stuff and put it in a five pound bag. Now we can talk about sustainability all day long. We can talk about lofty terms, environmental, social, economic. But at the end of the day, we're talking about the bedrock principle of economic theory, the theory of scarcity. The fact that we have infinite wants and only finite resources to meet them. That is the context that we face today. So what's the problem? The problem is it's not just that we have this many people. It's where the people and where the, where the development is going to come from. It's going to come from developing countries. Meaning the folks that have less are going to want more. Because technology is making everything accessible to all. So it's not just that there is more people, it's more people consuming more. And what does that mean? It means the sense of urgency rises tremendously. It means that the time to running out of resources is closer and closer and closer than it's ever been. That's the problem. The problem is this issue of scarcity and how we're going to allocate our resources because there are real economic issues. There's quality of life. There's the ability to sustain life on the planet. And it has to come about. The solutions have to come about now. So let's talk about solutions to the issues and the challenges we face. Because I want to be clear about something. This is not a liberal or a conservative issue. This is not a Democrat or Republican issue. This is a global issue. This is the reality. These are the problems we face. So how do we solve the problem? I think there's three ways. First of all, we have to recognize that the United States must lead the world out of this problem. Why the United States? Because we are the only country with the financial capital, the intellectual capital, the moral capital, and the creative capital to solve these problems. So we must lead it from the United States. The second thing we have to realize is that we must learn to speak the language of business to business about business. Or sustainability 
stays a motivational poster on the wall. Why? Because business controls the fundamental allocation of resources on the planet. We have to learn to say not only is profit not a bad word, profit is something we must attain. Because if we're not financially sustainable, we can't even begin to address these other problems and start bringing about our collective wisdom to solve the problems. So what is the real root of the problems? I could sit here today and talk about thoughts that I have for fixing inner city schools or addressing the black belt or all sorts of things. But I started to become possessed by the problem behind the problem. And the problem behind the problem is we have to understand what's happening with democracy in the world. In the world, what we're finding and we celebrate is the breakout of democracy. The Arab Spring, Bahrain, Tunisia, Egypt, Libya. The problem with democracy, though, is it's an inherently sloppy process. You can't take people who've not been allowed to have a thought, let alone an opinion, let alone express it, for 50, 60, 100 years, say, congratulations, you're Democrat, now, you're democratic now, line up in neat rows, oh, 49 to 51%, okay, 51% to decide what everybody's going to do. It doesn't work that way. And that creates uncertainty. And that creates confusion. So we have to be the models in the United States of this stewardship of democracy. Democracy is growing globally. We have to sit here and be the stewards. Yet, at the same time, as the world is going more democratic, becoming more of a democracy, we here in the United States have started to replace democracy with dogma. We have started taking our debate and getting away from the basic tenets of what makes democracy successful, which is simple. We have to be informed and educated. We have to understand that we're not always right all the time. We have to participate and we have to be willing to compromise. But above all, we have to be willing and demand that we use our own voice and not give our voice to somebody else. Yes, we are not a true democracy in the United States. We're a representative democracy, which means we elect leaders to be our voice. And therein lies the issue. And therein lies the potential solution. We have to become better stewards of democracy. My generation, by and large, has failed at being stewards of democracy. Our version of democracy is agree with me or I'll take my football and go home. And again, I stress, this is not a liberal, conservative, Democrat, Republican. We are all playing the game right now. We are willing to shut down our governments unless we get our way. That is not democracy. Democracy is having your beliefs, not compromising them, and staying at the table and fighting and fighting and fighting and fighting, but never leaving the table. Democracy is saying, I will put the process above my own arrogance. It's action above arrogance. It's celebrating the possible versus the perfect. Perfection is the enemy of the good. It is the excuse to do nothing at all. In a democracy, 80% of something is far better than 100% of nothing. And if we are going to lead the world out of this, this challenge, this very, very real challenge that we have, we have to be better stewards of democracy. 80% of something is better than 100% of nothing. This is what the world looks like. If everybody in Asia and Africa start consuming at the rate America does, that entire chart fills up and we use up our resources. But when I say 80% of something is still better, you know that 80% of something in America is still seven times better than 100% of China and what India has to offer right now. This is the per capita GDP of the three countries by industry segment. In the United States, we're about $92,000 per person in per capita GDP. The next closest is in the industrial segment in China, and it's 10,000. So yes, quite literally, 80% of something is 72,000. It's seven times better than the best China has to offer. We have to be willing to take the 80% of something if we want to move forward. So the question then becomes, how do we do that? What is the idea? If we want to change the way people act, we have to change the way they think. And to change the way they think, we have to recreate the debate. And so my solution is this. We need to quit having red dots and blue states and blue dots and red states and seeing the world through those two lenses. My proposal to you today is to create purple dots, to be the purple dots. And it must come from your generation. Leadership is not given, it is taken. It is time for your generation to take that leadership. And the best place to take leadership is say, we want to construct the debate differently. 
We want to sit here and put democracy ahead of dogma, possible ahead of perfection. We want to put achievable ahead of arrogance. The arrogance that maybe, maybe I might, maybe I might not be infallible. So what purple dots are is simply that. Purple dots don't replace your Democrat or your Republican bumper sticker. It's a dot you put next to it. It's a dot you paint on a bridge. It's a dot that, oh yes, you have the technology that we never had. You can right now make the decision to do something about it. You have your phones. You have your tweeting. You have your Facebooks. You can either start a viral movement to say we are going to demand of our leaders that they construct their debate differently so that we can actually have the debate and have the discussion that leads to the solution. Until we talk about it, we can't even begin to change the way people think and we can't even begin to come about the solutions that are so desperately nipping at our heels. So my challenge to y'all is this. Do something. So I'd like to share a story with you that goes back to 1968. February 1st, 1968, I was living in Australia. My three brothers and my sister and I. Very happy, very good upbringing. And on February 1st, my life changed forever because during the course of that day, my sister Kathy drowned in our swimming pool. We were having a pool party. Everybody was there. And we turned our heads for just an instant, all of us collectively, and ran inside to get our drinks. And I was sent out to find Kathy. Orange Fanta in a blue cup with a white rim. I was six years old and I remember it like it was yesterday. And instead I found Kathy drowned in the bottom of our swimming pool. We were not gone. We hadn't turned our attention for more than a second. And she was gone. I learned two things that day. First thing I learned is, well, even with your best intentions, sometimes God's hand is greater than our own and he will call us home. It was nobody's fault. But I started to think about this, and this is what I want to put out to you. At what time does slightly turning your head for a second become a minute, become an hour, become a day, become a month, become a year? At what time does turning your head become apathy, and apathy become ignorance, and ignorance become neglect? The challenge for you is this. The challenge for me is this. When are we going to quit being apathetic? When are we going to quit opening our papers and saying, there they go again? When are we going to demand of our leaders that they construct the debate differently so that we get to meaningful solutions? It's your choice. You can sit here and go, eh, decent speech, or not a decent speech. Killed an hour on a Saturday morning. Oh, it's pretty good. Or you can decide to do something about it. We can talk about our leadership, or we can choose to talk about ourselves. The way to solve our problems, to begin to address these large global issues, is as simple as purple dots. The purple dot on your mirror reminds you, I'm going to construct my debate differently. I'm going to sit with the person that I disagree with and hear them, and we are going to hammer out. But I am not, I am not, I am not going to give up my democracy. I am not going to give up our position of global leadership that is and must be the leader that changes the world. It is your choice. It is your choice. Dogma over democracy, arrogance over action, the perfect over the possible, or do I understand that I will not let apathy beget ignorance, beget neglect. It is your choice, it is our choice. Thank you.